I'm about to give you a little insight on my new Zone System Express 7 panel. Now, many people may not know about all the iterations that the Zone System Express has been through, so that's what I'm gonna show you now, a little before and after action on how I use this panel in a complete workflow walkthrough. Now, this panel was designed to be a workflow solution, not just another tool for Photoshop and not just another luminosity masking panel. Okay, I'm gonna show you that right now. So let's go ahead and open up the Zone System Express 7. I'm gonna give you a little walkthrough on this as I edit this image. What we have here is a photo that is complete from Adobe Camera Raw. I did some stacking for four different images, put them all together so that I could edit this photograph. I did show that in another video tutorial, which I will link below. So here I am after Adobe Camera Raw, I am ready to start working. So the first thing I do here is I have a process called tone, color, and effects. Now this module is very strong and heavy based on the tone and color sections. The effect stuff is pretty much the things that I do in my other panel called palette effects. But let's talk about the tone, color, and effects that can happen here in the Zone System Express. First thing I would do is I would work on my tones. Well, right here, either in the blend if section or the mask section, you get the opportunity to break down your image into five distinct zones. So what you'll notice is how fast these zones were built. These zones are built that fast because they are blend if based. Blend if based zones work really fast and build really fast. So let me go ahead and take a look at these. I'm just gonna go ahead and minimize this a little bit here so that I can look at my curve a little bit better because everything in the Zone System Express is pretty much based off of the curve because it's the most powerful tool out there. So essentially what I have here is I have this blend diff zero to one. If I turn view mask on, that will show you that in magenta, that's the darkest darks, view mask off. I'll go into zones two and three, view mask on, view mask off. I'll go into zones four, five, and six, which are gonna be the heaviest handed zones on here. And I'll turn that off. And then I'll go into zones seven and eight, view mask on, view mask off. And this is really just to show you what is being selected from this blend if selection. Okay. So that's the only pure white area in the image. I'm probably actually just going to delete that one because I'm not going to need it anyway. So zones zero and one. I want to make those a little bit darker to add some more contrast to this image. Well, right here, I have these things called curves modifiers. So if I just press negative one, it will take those darkest dark areas and make them a little bit darker. You see it happening right there along the shoreline. Now, if I make that negative three, it's going to make them a lot darker. And what it does is it automatically adjusts the curve as I um, work through just pressing these buttons here, these curves modifiers. So I'll go to zones two and three here, and let's see what happens when I do, let's say like an S curve on there. Now the S curve is great because it's gonna make those darks darker in that in those zones two and three, which are gonna be your next to darkest dark areas. And it's also going to lift up the curve on the white side or the light side to round off that contrast. So think about this when we do the S curve on the image as a whole. Now, just doing the S curve on each individual blend diff zone can actually give you some really good results because you're now breaking down individual areas of the image and tightening the contrast. Okay. So now we'll go into zones four, five, and six. We'll take a look at what that S curve does. I like that actually. It does a pretty good job of making the uh, darks darker and the lights lighter in our mid-tone areas. We turn view mask on, you can see that's gonna be our mid-tone areas. Now, the thing is here, when you press one of these buttons, it, you don't just get it for face value. You have these items here, which are going to be opacity, 10 through 100, and fill, 10 through 50, and then 100 to basically reset it. You also have some other blend modes here. Like right now, this is set to luminosity, but if I change it to normal, that will be adjusting the color and the luminance value. Typically in the blend if zone section here in when I'm working with tone, I don't really want to work with color. So I pretty much keep it at luminosity. Now we'll go into zone seven and eight view mask on. That's going to be that background area there. Pretty much what's going on there and what's going on in the water. Let's do a plus one on that one. Brighten that up a little bit. Pull the viewer in through those highlights a little bit. So now I can minimize that. I've got my tones done and it's looking really good. Press this button here. That will get me into my colors. So now it breaks down my colors into the individual color zones for red, yellow, green, cyan, blue, and magenta. And it does this via blend if. That's why it's so stinking fast, it's awesome. So if I go into the red blend if here, I can turn view mask on to see what that's gonna be. Because it's blend if based, it's pretty much targeting the channel of the color red, not the physical pixel value of the color red, which is nice because as we edit these colors, we can actually get a nice blend 
Uh, what happens is if you do color strict color selections for your colors without doing it channel based, you end up getting these really weird uh, kind of like color saturation artifacts that happen when you try to manipulate your color at this level. So let's go ahead and go into the reds and see what happens when we pop an S curve on the reds. We're making the darkness in the color red a little bit darker and then making the brightness in the color red a little bit brighter. Now in the curves modifiers, you're going to see shadows, highlights, and midtones, and then your red and cyan, magenta and green, and blue and yellow. What these are targeting are the RGB curves. So when we say a bump up in the shadows, giving it a little bit more red in the color red of the shadows, hit that button, we get a little bit more red popping up in the shadows. We can get a little bit more red popping up in the highlights of the color red as well. Now if we want to offset that, instead of giving it more red and take away some red, we can go into the cyan button that's here and it will taper away the red, subdue the red by adding cyan to it. In this case, I probably actually want a little bit of that red in there. So I'll click the red in the shadows. We can also add maybe a little bit of yellow to the color red, maybe just yellow to the shadows of the color red or yellow to the highlights of the color red. Really extreme power, just at the click of a button, you can see how it's very subtly editing the colors that are happening in the color yellow here. Now, of course, we also have our opacity here. So if that's a little bit too much, you can drop the opacity here or drop it to maybe 80% here on the panel as well. And that looks pretty good for our color red. I'm going to go into the yellows and probably the blues, and then I'll move on just for the sake of this tutorial. So in the color yellow, we have our S curve for the yellows, or maybe just a plus one for those color yellows. Let's see what yellow is being targeted by anyway. Okay, so we'll view mask off. Yellow is targeting pretty much the outside edges of the uh, the water there that is coming on the edge and also some of the what's going on in the colors back there in the trees. So let me go ahead and make that a little bit darker and then maybe a little bit brighter on that color yellow. Okay, so I'm, I'm going into the, the individual colors and manipulating those as well, which is great because now we have more control over our colors rather than just giving it a curve just for the entire RGB uh, of the image or the red, green, and blue of the image. We're going into individual colors within the image, which is really impactful. Now, this is some surgical type of editing. You don't have to get this deep with it. I like to get this deep with my editing um, after Adobe Camera Raw and after my raw processing because I think I get the best uh, looking image for my work. So I'll go ahead and look at what's happening with the blues. Lots of stuff going on in the blue there. Let's see what happens when we pop on an S curve. Maybe brighten up those blues. Maybe give it a plus one S curve, maybe a negative three. I don't like it when it gets darker in the blues. Too moody, too dramatic. Maybe we'll just go like maybe just a plus one in there and brighten up those blues a little bit. I think that looks actually pretty good there. I like that. I like what we're going on with that. So let's go ahead and close these layers down. We've worked on our tones. We've worked on our colors. I'll turn these off so you can kind of see what's happening there. Now, if we look at these, if one of these is, is a little bit too much, like right now, I'm looking at the blend if zone mask and I'm like, ooh, after doing that color work, I don't know if I really like it being this strong. Well, I can just click on the folder as a whole and just drop the opacity of that entire folder by about to 70%, even going into the colors and dropping that by about 70%. So my goal here is to work high, get it to a high peak, the, the peak of what I'd want it to look like, and then taper it back. And the reason why is that everything in my editing process is a buildup of one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. So as I'm building up, I don't wanna work too fast. So what happens here is if I work too fast with the blend if zones and the color zones, when I go to do my effect based stuff, I'm gonna get these weird artifacts that are happening in the image because I'm trying to push data too far that doesn't look like it belongs there. Now, before I get into my effect based stuff, let's take a look at the image because as I look at this image, I see that there's two people next to my subject that I really don't want them there. So I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in on these individuals that are here. And once I zoom in on them, it looks like they're looking right at me thinking, who is this fool that is so close to the water? They're waiting for a wave to just smack into me, aren't they? Well, it didn't happen. Sorry, ladies. <laughs> I'm going to go into the ZSC7. On the right-hand side, we have our brushes. Now, I did a video tutorial not too long ago showing my 10 brilliant blender brushes. Well, in this panel, I've incorporated those blender brushes so that you can use those in the panel and not have to go and try to access them through your brush panel. It's, it's a pain. I also made four custom button sections. So once you make your own custom brushes, you can put them on this panel as well. 
Why I like this panel, this brush selection panel here is that it's based on, it's not based on the brush itself, like the brush tool. This is a tool panel. So I could go into the clone stamping tool and I could select this brush here. And then on a new layer, I could make my brush a little bit smaller, press alt or option, and then I can just clone stamp these individuals out using my brilliant blender brushes. So I get a really nice blend. Now these brushes, the reason why these brushes are so successful in my workflow is that they work nice and slow, which is great. They work nice and slow. I can get a nice buildup. And if it's not looking right, I can maybe grab another one of these, like maybe this one. And I can use this brush to kind of help blend in that a little bit as well. You use maybe some more of the, the bushes here to kind of cover up that fence. And then let's see what we can do here by covering up that look there. Maybe make this a little bit bigger and grab a little bit of some of that uh, up here to get some of that kind of, oop, I don't want that, control Z, to get some of this peeking through the clouds type stuff, or peeking through the trees, the clouds there peeking through the trees to cover that up a little bit. Now I'll zoom out, and they are covered up, perfect. So the brush panel is awesome because it doesn't just work with the brush itself, it also works with tools like the clone stamping tool. Okay, so I got my tones good, got my colors good. That was just a little bit of gee whiz to show you all the cool brushes that are happening in this panel. Let's move on to some of my effect-based things. There's a new effect that I have in here called the Channel Radiance, which is actually a pretty awesome radiating glow. This is completely different than many of the glows that you're gonna see out there. It has this Orton style effect look to it, but the really cool thing about it is that it works on the channel. So. What happens here is here you have your radiating glow effect here, but then you have a channel radiance adjustment on top of that. So this is kind of how I work with it. Um, I've already got some preset functions for you here, but you can move these adjustments. So we're in the red channel. I'm making the red channel brighter by moving the greens up, okay? So it's affecting the radiating glow, the channel of the radiating glow to do this. I know a lot of this stuff sounds really nerdy, but in the education that I have for the Zone System Express, I talk all about these things. So you'll get a better understanding of this when you go through that education. Now I go into the green channel, going into the green channel, we can see what happens here. You see how it's kind of like, you can see how it's almost like a dodging and burning type of effect. It's pushing and pulling those colors. And we can visually see it as we move the slider happening right here. But once we stop, it's almost like it just blends in perfectly and our eye doesn't see it anymore. Okay, so we can brighten that up in the reds there. And let's look at the blues of the red or the green channel there. Okay, so we get this really nice radiating effect. It's just a really nice finishing effect actually, and it can do wonders on your images uh, when used subtly. And I'll show you how to make it a little bit more subtle because as I said, I like to work to the peak and then pull it down, okay? So that's kind of what happens with this channel radiance. We work at the peak and then with the constant, if you actually move this up to the right, um, not to the left because it doesn't do anything as you move it to the left. If you move it up to the right, it will actually kind of taper that effect and blend it a little bit better. We can go into the green channel, move this up to the right, kind of tapers it and blends it a little bit better. Move up to the red channel, tapers it and blends it a little bit better, okay? Now, looking at that radiance glow, does it do a good job? I think it does a pretty good job, uh, but if it's too strong, again, you can always lower the opacity of this, okay? So we can lower the opacity maybe 80%, take about 20% of that away. Now, a lot of times we might ask ourselves, well, how do we know when we're done? How do we know when we have pulled the viewer into our image and when we're done? And the answer to that question isn't always as simple and as easy as one might think. That's why I've added a tone assessment button here, which is actually very similar to what you may have seen on my channel before with my five tone heat map. This tone assessment is a great tool. It's actually something that's pulled from my course called the Game of Tones. And what this does is it shows you where the viewer is coming in through your image. We're coming into the white areas. We've minimized this image down to its, its highlights, its shadows, and its mid-tones in the most literal sense. They're coming in through the highlights, they're seeing the mid-tones, and then they're kind of having these stopping points on all the shadowy areas. And that's a good thing because those stopping points kind of act as barriers to make the eye navigate through the highlights and the shadows. And we don't even know what's happening. Okay. So when I turn this off, you can see like, oh yeah, I am coming in through here. I'm being magically whisked through the waves. And then I'm taking a nice break and looking at the uh, lighthouse above there. But what does our image look like from the very beginning? So let's go ahead and move this. We'll just turn all these off. 
Here it is at the very beginning. This is straight out of Adobe Camera Raw. The only thing that the viewer is really taking a look at right when they first see the image is the lighthouse. They really don't even care about the things that are happening down below, do they? But as we turn these on and we see all this work that we've done here, we've pushed and pulled the highlights, the midtones, and the shadows. And we've seen now that the viewer is actually invited in through that open, foggy cloud space, unfortunately, that I had here, brightened it up nicely and naturally so it's not over bright or uh, too foggy and they come in through the image and they can see the entire image as a whole rather than just oh there's a lighthouse move on oh there's a lighthouse move on there's something in the foreground there's there's waves pulling me in these are the types of things that happen that's why this is a workflow system it's a workflow solution it's not just a luminosity masking panel that gives you pretty masks it's not just an effect based panel that magically push a button and something happens Everything on this panel is laid out in a way that it gives you access to every single thing that's happening there because I want you to use it as a workflow solution and not a tool for Photoshop. I know I navigated through it really fast, but a lot of people have asked me, Blake, I've seen your landing page that you have for this and it doesn't really explain how this is going to benefit me in my workflow. Well, how this benefits you is that this is not another Photoshop tool. This is a workflow solution. I built my tone, color, and effects workflow mantra into a tool to help guide you along with your process to help you make magnificent looking images. Now, there's also some other things on here that are really useful in the effects section. One of them that, that I want to talk about is the Enhance Contrast 2 button probably my favorite button on the Zone System Express panel. And the reason why is that this is a super detailer to the point that this tool here can almost fix an image that is slightly blurry and out of focus, whether that's motion blur or hand blur. I've done it. I've used it before on that and it's great. But where it can be really useful is by pulling the viewer into the image into areas that you want to be a little bit more detailed for them to see. So when I look at the rocks here, again, as I said, this is going to be harsh and it's going to be garish at first because I want you to start at the peak and work yourself down. So the way this works, if we turn this on and off, look at that. You see that back here in this area here, those details aren't looking that great. Now, in many cases, I probably could have focus stacked this image in order to get that look uh, of you know everything being in tack sharp detail. But with the Enhance Contrast 2 button, while I'm out on my locations, I don't necessarily need to work about focus stacking because I know that I can just use the Enhance Contrast 2 to help pull some of that detail and data in. Now, this is set to the Linear Light Blend Mode, which means we can control this with fill. As I drop the fill, you're going to see that it takes the harshness off of that sharpening that's happening there. Once I get that set where I want it to be, I can drop the opacity a little bit so that it blends in nicely and it doesn't look like a harsh, garish sharpen. Instead, it looks like a nice, um, almost as if it would have been if I actually would have focused stacked this image. So I'll zoom out and then zoom in and look at other areas in the image here, like in the foreground. Okay, does a nice job of adding some nice sharpening to those areas. I, what I, you wanna do with this is you wanna actually press Command or Control I on this to invert that mask and then B for the brush tool. And here we're gonna brush in with the color white where we want that stuff to come back. Again, using these brushes here, I'm gonna use um, one of my more uh, faster blending brushes, this one right here. I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller and I'm gonna brush that in anywhere I want that to come back with the color white. I don't want that to be on the waves because they're nice and moving and wispy. They should not be detailed. Okay, I want that to be happening just on the rocks, maybe the lighthouse and maybe those trees in the back there. And then we'll zoom in to make sure that when we do that, it still looks good. I'd say it does, it looks good. All right, I think it does. As I said, this is not just another tool for Photoshop. This is a workflow solution. I feel very strongly about that and that's why I built this as a workflow solution and not just another tool for Photoshop. If you're interested in learning more about the Zone Sim Express, you can click this link here to go to the landing page. You can also click the link below. And if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing. I try to take very difficult things in Photoshop and make them very simple. I certainly hope you enjoyed this. Thank you for taking the time to watch it.